So basically what I will try to do during the lecture is introduce the concept of workflows and uh, why we should start thinking, or at least in my opinion, we should start thinking about the material science and characterization in terms of workflows rather than one-off experiments. And uh, during the tutorial part, I will introduce some basic concepts and sort of share my experience of uh, understanding the basic tools for the workflow development and uh, illustrate some of the more advanced tools that we have been working on for the last uh, several years. So this work is obviously done by a team. So nothing in machine learning and experiment can be done in it by a single person. So this includes myself and my colleagues at the University of Tennessee and uh, the crowd uh, at Oak Ridge, uh, many of whom have the joint affiliations with the UT as well. So just as the small correction to uh, what Sebastian mentioned about my position. So I have been at Oak Ridge for about 20 years. So moving from Vigna Fellow to Corporate Fellow. So starting in uh, uh, 40 days from now, I start my position as the chair professor at the University of Tennessee. And then I basically take a year off to spend uh, uh, a year as the research sabbatical at Amazon. So now I'm actually a proud Amazonia. So uh, this generally gives my background. So this is the Center for Nanophase Material Science where most of the work that I'm going to talk about has been uh, done. And uh, there's an important thing in deference to my colleagues there. So this is a user facility, meaning that all the capabilities that I'm going to talk about and all the codes are actually available for collaboration through the Department of Energy user program. So this being said, let me start with the very uh, simple uh, slide that uh, basically summarize why we need uh, to develop and make better materials. So currently there is a tremendous amount of discussions about the future of green energy, about the quantum computing, about uh, new biomolecules and uh, biomolecular design. And ultimately it goes down to three parameters. It goes to functionality, it goes to manufacturability and it goes to cost. Notice that um, about 15 years ago, uh, the paper by Gerd Sider basically become a key point after which the theoretical community start to get machine learning very seriously. And many programs, including Nomad, uh, were the centers of development of these techniques. However, theory is absolutely not enough. So theory can sort of predict functionality in special cases. Manufacturability and cost uh, basically come only from the experimental experience. So knowing the electrochemistry on the quantum level, uh, it is absolutely not trivial to translate it into the construction of the gigafactory and particularly doing so in the cost efficient manner. So what are the challenges that uh, we, uh, we uh, face in the near future. So the obvious one is uh, batteries. So this is the illustration of the growth of the batteries for applications ranging from EVs to stationary storage to consumer electronics. We know that uh, batteries absolutely required if we are able to introduce the solar uh, energy big time, simply because we generally need energy, not at the time when the solar energy can be produced. Uh, the problem that we face with the batteries is that the lithium ion is quite possibly the, in the Goldilocks zone for the light EV applications. It is not clear whether the lithium ion batteries are the best solution for the heavy tracking. And uh, it is probably fair to say that the lithium ion batteries are not the best solution for the grid storage as well. The difficulty the, is that if you try to design a practical commercial solution, you have to contend with the fact that lithium ion technology is almost saturated. So the prices are now at the commodity level and they actually even rising because of the lithium availability. All alternative technologies, whether it is metal layer or whatever, they're at the much early development stages. So we use lithium because it's available, not because it is best. So the question becomes, knowing what we know now, can we choose the right technology to predict which one can be developed and deployed faster? 
Same problem appears for the applications like photovoltaic. So if you look at the emerge, uh, development of the photovoltaic market over the last 13 years, you can see that uh, it actually can be disrupted fairly easily. So until three years ago, it was dominated by multi-crystalline silicon. Now it becomes uh, almost pure single crystal silicon. You know what? Uh, the discovery of the hybrid perovskites basically gives us the material with almost dream property for the solar applications. They have a absolutely unique intrinsic properties of the material. Uh, they can be pan gap tuned. They can be at least in principle deposited very easily. Problem is that it is uh, they're not that easy to manufacture. Somehow we can make a perfect solar cell on the lab level when it is a square centimeter. When we try to scale the solar cell to the large volume, somehow the intensity drops. So this is a manufacturability issue. It's not a problem with the not understanding the physics of this material. And interestingly, same problem appear in the context of on the other end of the scale. So if we talk about the quantum computing or things like single protein uh, sequencing, which is according to nature, is the technology to work in 2023, it's all about being able things reproducible and reliable. So in other words, we need to make stuff. Let's go deep into the details. So what I mean by the workflows and how the workflow development can bridge what we do in the labs versus what we want to accomplish in the large scale facilities. So let's look at the uh, metal halide perovskite. So very interesting materials. This is essentially a perovskite where we have the organic molecules on the A side. Uh, they are solution processable, so we can make single crystals, we can make films, we can make quantum dots, so whatever format you have. They have rather unique uh, defect properties, so due to the antibody character of the lead uh, states, the defects are sitting in the uh, conduction and valence band. They are not in the band gap, and therefore you don't have to deal with the uh, non radiatic recombination have very high optical absorption. So you can make a solar cell out of the perovskite, which is several hundred nanometers thin, sort of thousand times thinner than silicon, which in principle means that we should be able to integrate them with the polymers and basically deposit the solar on all the buildings and get solar energy for free. Also, they look much nicer than silicon cells. The problem is that, as I mentioned, you can make them in the lab making them at scale is difficult. So let's have a look at how the uh, hybrid perovskite lab works. So and this is a relatively small lab uh, comprised of five people. So nonetheless, it gives you the idea. So in all cases, we start with a specific reagent. Once we have the reagents in place, there are several things we can do. For example, we can use them for combinatorial synthesis using the lab robotics. And this provides a way to do the assay to study their stability and properties. So what you see here is the compositional phase diagram for one of the uh, hybrid perovskites. We can choose to grow a single crystal. So if we grow a single crystal, of course, it's much longer process. It takes uh, days to grow a crystal. Uh, it takes months to learn how to grow a crystal. However, <clears throat> sorry, once the crystal is in place, we can make it a part of the device and study the behavior for radiation detector, or we can take the crystal and do the neutron scattering and explore the inelastic uh, properties, uh, the phonon density of states, or we can do some complex measurements like DLTS to understand the carrier dynamics. Our third option is to make the films. So films are can be made fast, but it's sort of a film per 10 minutes or so. Once we make the film, we can, again, either make the device out of it and probe the functional properties, or we can explore the structure of the film using mass spectrometry or cathode luminescence or scanning probe microscopy, and so on and so forth. So uh, notice that even in one lab, laser focused on one specific class of materials, there are multiple pathways how we drive the scientific exploration process. And what makes it very interesting is that the results of one branch of exploration start to affect our decision making on the other parts of the exploration process. For example, we use the combinatorial synthesis 
in order to determine uh, or kind of speculate what type of fields we can make. So making 100 samples of nanocrystals is trivial. Making 100 films actually takes quite a while. We also need to make the feedback based on the characterization. So we can make devices in principle out of all the films. However, mass spectrometry and cathode luminescence measurements take a lot of time and uh, fairly expensive in terms of time and effort. So what we want to do is to somehow run these experiments and use the insights from these experiments as a feedback to optimization of our single crystal growth condition or film preparation or selection of the end members. So basically what I have illustrated now is the concept of the workflow. So the workflow is the sequence of the actions that you take in the lab. So this is a workflow centered on human or the workflow can be centered on the material. This is a sequence of transformations that we apply for a specific sample. And once you look at the workflow, you can uh, separate three, three parts to it. One is the ideation. That basically means the planning of the sequence of action going in the future. The second one is, of course, the orchestration of the workflow. So this is uh, really how you coordinate the different parts of the instruments and tools, so that essentially logistics. And of course, the third and most important part is the implementation. So somebody actually has to do the job. Notice that uh, these three parts uh, are separable. For example, if you deal with the automated labs like Emerald Cloud Labs in San Francisco, in that case, orchestration is done by the computer agent and the implementation is actually done by the humans. In the academic labs, typically the all three parts are done by humans, except that orchestration, ideation and part of the orchestration is typically the job of the PI. The students start with the implementation and this is how they learn. And once they learn, they start to uh, go more into the orchestration and then ideation of the workflows. So what would it take us to translate the workflows into the uh, machine learning language? So obviously the first thing that we need to do is we need to devise the hyper language which describes the operations that are possible in our lab. So uh, in many cases, scientific research operates on a lot of prior knowledge, on the intuition, on the things that are learned essentially as an apprenticeship. Well, that wouldn't work with the machine learning very well. So we need to define the set of commands and set of instructions that we can pass to the automated agent. We need to be able to do the dynamic planning, taking account the latencies and costs. So we need to know how to define how long does it take to make the film. And uh, we need to know how long does it define to make the specific measurement. And most importantly, we need to define the reward and value function. So what was very interesting for me over the last year, when I was working most on this concept of the workflows, is that designing the automated experiment or designing a workflow requires a very clear idea about why we are doing some particular experiment. So what is the value? So what is the total reward of the experiment? What do I want to accomplish? It can be scientific discovery if you're a basic scientist. It can be materials optimization. So that one is relatively straightforward. I want to make material with the specific properties. It can be something else. In some sense, this is the ultimate goal of the experimental activity in your specific lab. Uh, the second thing that comes into play is the value of the individual steps. So let's assume that I want to make the material that scales uh, to a meter squ uh, square solar cell with the efficiency of 30%. At some point, I want to understand what is the value of the individual measurement. So how much mass spectrometry tells me uh, how valuable is the feedback from the top sims or how valuable is the feedback from the device measurements. Obviously, we deal with the situation with a very high uncertainty and uh, it's not going to be uh, possible to ascribe this value from the get-go, but at least it's a good idea to start thinking about it. And part of the reason why we want to do that is that workflows that are designed in academic labs are often adopted by industry. So if you have a startup, uh, in the specific field, for example, solar cells or what's not, very often the startup will not have the firepower to build a totally new workflow. 
it will be centered on the workflow that is designed in the academic lab and then optimize this workflow to the point of mass production. So kind of important thing to consider. What's interesting is that just to illustrate the point of imaging uh, and the point of the workflow design is that very often the workflows are uh, hierarchical in nature. For example, the grand challenge for photovoltaics is to understand, is to make the uh, large scale devices. The uh, task for the individual lab can be to find the material that is stable and has a okay properties, but uh, the task of the scaling would be done by the industry. And the part of imaging, which would be a subset of the reward for the total lab workflow is to understand what happens in this material on the nanoscale and to translate this knowledge into the feedback for material synthesis of optimization. So the question becomes, how can we do that? So this is where the imaging becomes exceptionally possible. So for example, if we use techniques uh, such as TOFSIMS, we can figure out what is the chemical uniformity of the material. And uh, if we just get an example of one specific hybrid perovskite, which is uh, doped by cesium and annealed at different temperatures, you can see that the uh, structure of this material can be very different. So for uh, materials annealed uh, at low temperatures, we have a clear two-phase segregation and formation of some sort of mixed phases. For materials annealed at high temperature, we have the formation of lead iodide and the way it is formed very much depends on the cesium concentration. And here we have a sweet spot where the material is essentially uniform. Notice that this is an example of the fairly simple grid search, but it's basically a significant number of measurements and pretty, pretty, uh, pretty expensive tool. Another challenge that we have is that uh, we can study the same material using a different techniques, using cathode luminescence. So in this case, we shine the light, oh, sorry, we shine the electron beam in the material we detect the uh, spatially resolved uh, uh, CL spectrum. So it's a kind of photoluminescence, but on the level of uh, 10 of nanometers or so. And this gives us an idea about the physical property of this material. So both techniques give us some information about the structure and, sorry, structure properties and composition. We can look at the same material, but uh, we are not looking at the same region of the same material. So both techniques are actually, uh, to some extent, are destructive. So the challenge that we have is how do we combine the knowledge acquired from two different methods into more or less integrated picture of what happens inside the material. And uh, even in this case, uh, both TOFSIMS and CL gives us information about, uh, about the composition and the photoluminescence but they don't give us the information about the transport properties. So ideally we want to combine these measurements with the AFM uh, transport measurements in order to figure out what happens inside this material. The problem is that AFM will give us very good idea about the transport, but really not chemical composition or anything else. So the question becomes, can we make our microscopes work better? So we uh, want to make sure that we kind of operate them in a more intelligent way. And can we learn how to combine the information coming from different microscope in such a way as to derive the statistically significant representation of materials properties and functionality? So think about it this way. Once you work with the uh, machine learning or any kind of Bayesian optimization method, you always have to deal with the concept of the IID, identically distributed data. So if you have the same sample explored by different microscope modalities, uh, this sample, this is a IID case. It is exactly the same sample. You don't have a reasons to believe that there would be a variation from one sample to another if they're fabricated under the ideal conditions. But uh, it's not the same place. And also what is very important is that uh, for those of you who are familiar with the microscopy, uh, currently this technique has a very significant limitation. So there are a lot of materials in the world. So there are not even 50,000, there are some more like uh, 50, uh, 100,000 ambient SPMs. Uh, there are thousands of electron microscopes. 
So the total market for electron microscopy is something like $3 billion now, so it's very measurable. The market for scanning probe microscopes is slightly less than a billion dollars, so that's a lot. But all of these microscopes for the time being are operated by humans. And uh, over the last several years, there was a very large number of opinion pieces and uh, aspirational uh, talks about how can we make microscopy automated. And of course, uh, a lot of this inspiration came from areas such as autonomous cars and so on and so forth. Now, here comes the catch. And the catch is that uh, there are two catches, actually. So the first catch is that uh, autonomous cars are still very much under the debate. So there is a limited success, but by far and large, despite the statements by Uber or Elon Musk that we will have automated car in 2017, uh, it still hasn't happened yet. Second problem, as I mentioned, is that we always need to think about the concept of the reward of the experiment, why we are doing it. For automated car, for, uh, for autonomous car, the reward is very simple. We want to get from point A to point B in the shortest amount of time, and we also don't want to have a crash. It's a very simple reward function, and therefore pretty much everybody who works in the field of the autonomous vehicles is actually not thinking much about it. They start to think about sub-problems, like how do I detect the state of the road? How do I identify the intention of the human on the crossroad? So these are sort of engineering problems. But if we talk about making the autonomous microscopy, we know that on the one hand, it should be much easier than automated car because our risks are lower, our hyper language in which we communicate with our tools is actually much simpler. But the thing that we really need to think about is the reward. Why are we doing the automated experiment? What is our the purpose? And then kind of using the Amazonian language, once we define our reward, we need to work backward from this reward in order to build our workflow. So let me show you an example for how the typical scanning probe microscope experiment goes. So notice that we started from the whole field of let's make a better device. We narrowed it down to synthesis and characterization of better material. And now we're going one level lower to the point of designing the workflow of running the microscope. So typically microscopes are driven by humans. So we start with tuning the microscope uh, to make sure that it works. Then we take the overview scan uh, to explore what happens inside the material. And then we start a set of operation when we zoom in on some region, we decide that we don't like it, we go back. We zoom in on another region, we can repeat this process. Then we finally find a region that we, for whatever reason, think is interesting. And then we can start to do some specific measurements. For example, we can take spectroscopy either in the individual location on the grid. What is very interesting, and uh, I will illustrate why it is important in a few uh, moments, is that we, uh, when human runs the microscope, we can trace this workflow only forward. For example, if we have the overview scan, we typically can select the region for the detailed studies because it's a sort of getting more information from this region. If we are zoomed in on the selected region, we generally don't know what happens around. There can be surprises. By the same token, if we take the local spectroscopy, for example, the hysteresis loop measurement, it is a very easy task, uh, challenge to say, hey, I want to get the spectroscopy here or here. But it is a very difficult challenge to say, look, I want to find the region where the, micro, the microstructure that gives rise to a certain response. So this is the direct measure, we just take it. This is the inverse prediction as any inverse problem, it's kind of complicated and generally human cannot do that. Of course, there is a way out. We can always take the measurement on the grid and then sort the results after the experiment. But the interesting challenge is that cannot be done in a kind of more automated fashion. So going back to uh, my description of the experiment and workflow, uh, the, if we want to use machine learning to run the experiment, we obviously need to define the minimal instruction set control language. So in other words, we need to be able to have our Python or whatever environment and have a set of commands that essentially imitate the human operations. 
What's interesting is that if you talk to uh, manufacturers, uh, somehow many of them seems to be focused more on things like tuning, but uh, this type of capabilities in the form of APIs are becoming available only in the last year or two. So uh, another thing that is very important to understand and to kind of think about is what guides our strategy in selecting the different regions on the sample surface. So imagine that I have the uh, access to exactly this information channel and I need to select the locations in which I want to do the measurement. So how am I going to do that? So in the very beginning, uh, being a good microscopist, I will uh, probably say, hey, these are the locations where there is a zero signal. So for based on my knowledge of physics, I know that these are not very interesting. And I'm going to do several measurements on these locations in order to do the baseline of my microscope behavior. After that, I'm going to say, look, the majority of my sample is occupied by the domain structures that look like this uh, parallel line, just the usual AC domains. I probably will choose these regions for the uh, studies as the second step. But if it turns out that my functional properties here, here, and here are the same, I basically conclude that I don't need to take measurements here and here. I already learned the structure property relationship in these areas. After that, I can say, hey, these regions are unusual. So I can choose to study them based on the fact that they are outliers. Or I can say that, look, based on my prior knowledge of physics, I think that these regions have the high strain concentration, and therefore I want to single out them for the detailed studies. Some of my colleagues who, for example, work on the flex electricity in the domain wall can say, look, this is a 180 degree domain wall. It has the regions with the high curvature. Therefore, I want to explore the polarization dynamics of the regions with the high curvature and regions with the low curvature. So notice, uh, why does it matter? Notice that I mentioned that when we design the automated experiment workflow, we need to define the reward function. And uh, even on this very simple example, my reward functions changed three times during the experiment. My initial reward function is driven by understanding how does the microscope work. So this is a pure instrumental task. My second reward function is uh, in some sense statistical in nature. I choose to explore the regions which comprise the vast majority of my sample because I need to have some general idea. After that, my reward functions start to be focused either on statistics like exploring outliers, or it becomes uh, informed by my prior knowledge and the hypothesis I had before I even started the experiment. And of course, once we talk about the human decision-making or human hypothesis, this of course is uh, highly biased and um, uh, kind of one operator will make different decisions than the different operator. So why is it difficult? It is difficult because if we want machine learning to run the automated experiment, we need to somehow to pass this complexity of the decision making to the machine learning algorithm, because otherwise, how it is expected to work. What's interesting, and uh, which was kind of very refreshing to me uh, to find out, is that uh, we have to deal with the same problems, not only for microscopy, but pretty much for everything else. So if we do the automated synthesis of the hybrid perovskites using the laboratory robotics, from some sense, it is almost the same problem. So you deal with the unknown phase diagram as opposed to the image space. You deal with the unknown processing trajectories as opposed to uh, spectroscopies. And uh, you also have surprises. So the phase diagram has the phase boundaries, the uh, lines differentiating the solid solution and mixture. So there is a lot of similarities. Same problem it actually emerges in the concept of the theory, like whatever statistical physics, like Ising model, whatever, to choose your, choose your preference. Uh, the only thing about the theory is that ex our experimental budgets are limited. In theory, we have uh, Moore's law for computing, meaning that we expect the increase of the computer firepower exponentially with time. And uh, the, my favorite application is when the microscopy and uh, combinatorial synthesis come together. So for example, we can create the 
combinatorial libraries. This is a one dimensional one. Uh, of course, combinatorial libraries can be much more complicated. You can develop the uh, spread libraries that expo uh, that encode even ternary, quaternary phase diagrams. And the nice thing about the combinatorial library that it collects all the samples within a specific uh, phase diagram. For example, this one is the bismuth ferrite. So uh, on the one end, it's pure bismuth ferrite. This is just a ferroelectric phase. On the other end, it's uh, samarium dope bismuth ferrite. So it is the orthorhombic phase. So if I move along the surface of this combinatorial library, that means that I'm traversing this phase diagram and uh, therefore this material contains the really regions with the really interesting physics. My limitations come from the fact that if I want to study it by scanning probe microscopy, electron microscopy, I need to know where to sample. I cannot do electron microscopy measurements every 10 millimeters, that's unviable. So somehow I need to do measurements in several locations and then find out where would I want to go. So this basically brings us to the point that we have the uh, laboratory workflows and we need to learn how to optimize them on multiple level. One is the optimization on the single step. So this is essentially a greedy optimization. You have a workflow with the multiple steps and you want to make each step optimal. Obviously, if you do that, it does mean that the whole workflow is optimal as well because there is cross correlations between the different workflow stages. So greedy strategies are often not the best strategies. Uh, the second step is the optimization of the linear workflows. So this is the problem that is well as, um, explored in the stochastic optimization. And the most interesting challenge is the design of workflows that have multiple steps, that have feedbacks, and that have branches. So in some sense, how would you do that? And the question becomes, well, let's start to see if the machine learning can help us. And of course, uh, last decade was the decade of the exponential growth of machine learning. Uh, I mean, all of you are familiar with this diagram, which shows the essentially the inflection point starting from deep learning applied to ImageNet all the way to the recent developments up to AlphaFold and so on and so forth. But notice a very interesting thing that the impact in experimental physics have been so far rather minimal. So there was a big uptick of papers and publications starting from about 2017, 2018. Uh, there are a lot of groups that explore ML but uh, the real impact have been not that large, to be honest. And what's also interesting is that when it comes to the real world applications of machine learning, it awfully looks like that big companies like Amazon or Google or Microsoft actually start to retreat a little bit from the real world. So the focus is on the theory. So why is it difficult? So if you want to apply machine learning for material synthesis or microscopy, First of all, it requires my domain expertise and domain specific goals. So what are our reward functions? What are our values? It also requires causal and hypothesis driven uh, approaches. So the reason for that is that most of the machine learning methods rely on what is known as the big data. So the assumption is that if we have a lot of data about something, we would be able to synthesize it in such a way uh, in the way that doesn't require us to know, understand the physics of the materials. This unfortunately doesn't work with the experiment. Our experimental budgets are usually very, very small. So we pretty much don't have big data. We may have large data volumes for specific modalities, but they're not big data in the sense of representing the generative distribution. Uh, of course, uh, there are uh, social issues like the fact that machine learning is a culture, that results on open code, open data, and sort of relevant infrastructure. But uh, thankfully, in the last five years, the fact that these are very important is uh, starting to become understood and accepted, and more importantly, even supported. So this part is getting much better. But uh, the part of the experimental physical sciences that are very difficult for machine learning is that ultimately, scientific research is the active process. We are not working with the static data set. We try to design the experiment based on some hypothesis, which is our belief in how a system may behave. And based on this ex uh, experiment, we want to narrow down our hypothesis space. So we want to sort of falsify our hypothesis. 
and we also want to keep our eyes open for the new discovery. So this cycle from theory to experiment and then back to theory and uh, iterative development, this is not captured very well by the current machine learning paradigms. Therefore, it is up to us as a expert, domain experts to figure out how to do that. Just to illustrate uh, this statement, so there is a tremendous amount of the uh, investment from the leading uh, AI companies into the machine learning for physics, or as they call it, AI for science. Absolutely, the vast majority of this investment is uh, into theory, not really an experiment. So, let's switch gears a little bit and talk about the automated experiment and how difficult it is. And uh, the most interesting thing that uh, you can uh, kind of speculate is that automated experiment is actually uh, in some scenarios can be very easy and not even require uh, not even require machine learning. So as a very simple example, imagine that I work on the ferroelectric materials and I want to understand uh, the physical laws that guide the domain uh, wall motion versus the domain nucleation. So these are basic mechanisms that guide polarization dynamics. So the question is, how would I study them? It turns out that the experimental setup that allows you to do something like this is absolutely trivial. You just use your scanning probe microscope, you scan your probe. When you detect your domain wall, you use a, essentially a relay to apply a bias pulse. So in this case, this experiment could have been done 25 years ago. It doesn't require anything other than lock and amplifier and relay. But it has not been done because nobody have thought about it. Uh, that said, uh, it is fairly trivial to run and it works remarkably well. So this is the example of the domain evolution when we scan the surface and apply bias pulses only when we detect the walls. And in this way, we actually separate wall nucleation and wall growth. And notice that this automated experiment uh, doesn't require machine learning at all. So they're not equivalent. It can be done in slightly more complicated fashion. So in this case, uh, we take an image, we use the simple scikit uh, image in order to discover the objects of interest. And then we tell our microscope in order to go and take the hysteresis loop measurements at the pre-selected locations. So this is a little bit more complex type of the automated experiment. And notice the key difference between the uh, single line, what we call the ferrobot, and this type of experiment. In the ferrobot, we use the microscope as it is. Essentially, it's a small modification for the manufacturer setup. In this particular automated experiment, we add one very important part. We add the engineering controls to the microscope that allow us to realize the hyperlanguage that allows us to execute command of going to a specific location, if necessary, refine the position and then run the specific measurement. So the difficulty here was not in terms of machine learning or experimental design. The difficulty here was the engineering. Of course, machine learning can help tremendously. So this is the example of the now the uh, deep learning uh, network implemented as a plugin to the microscope. So in this case, you have the uh, microscope scanning the surface. Uh, the ensembled network analyzes the data stream in real time and shows you the position of the ferroelastic walls. And uh, since it's ensembled, it gives you the, the wall location and the uncertainty of the wall determination. And uh, if you look at this uh, video stream, you can say that, hey, this is just the edge filter. Uh, not exactly. So notice that we have two type of walls here. We have these ferroelastic walls, and we also have the ferroelectric wall. So uh, by eye, you can see that they, they're slightly different. These ones are kind of more diffuse and kind of a little bit, uh, a little bit, uh, uh, has a little bit of gradient inside them. Notice that our network finds only this type of domain walls, but it ignores this type of domain wall. Actually, that's not a very simple task because uh, the obviously edge filter or any kind of the radon transform type of or half transform type of analysis will basically find both type of walls at the same time. 
But once we define this object of interest, we can start to do interesting experiments. For example, we scan the surface, we find the domain walls that we're interested in, we select the locations of these domain walls for the deta detailed measurements, and then we run the hysteresis loop measurements only along those locations. And then you can see that uh, several interesting things. So for example, uh, one side of the domain wall and another side of the domain wall have different response. That's actually easy to understand because the ferroelastic domains are tilted with respect to surface normal. So we expect different conditions here and here. There are other factors of variation we don't understand very well. For example, you can see that if you move along the wall, there is a difference from this location and this location. So there is something else that goes on. Of course, if we have this type of approach, we can apply it for more complex materials. For example, the same uh, hybrid perovskites where we can essentially repeat the process. We use the uh, take an AFM image. We train our networks to identify the grain boundaries. And then we tell our AFM to do the measurements only on the grain boundaries. And then we get a, a sampling of the current voltage behaviors across the interfaces versus the sampling of the current voltage behavior within the grain. And uh, again, you can see that uh, there is some continuity of the functional response across the grain boundaries. And there are segments of the grain boundaries which are kind of uh, dead from the point of view of the conductivity. So this is great. Uh, we can explore this approach for, extend this approach for electron microscopy as well. So this is an example of the same type of algorithms running on the uh, STM using the Neon Swift plugin. So you get the data and then you convert it to the atomic coordinates. And in this case, we can do cool things. For example, if we know where all the atoms are, we can move our electron beam across the specific path and basically draw the single defect lines inside the material. But in everything that I've shown you, there is one very big catch. In some sense, what we have done here is exactly what the human operator can do. So we decided that domain walls are interesting in advance. And therefore, we studied those domain walls. We decided that for the atomically resolved images, we want to find atoms and perform some operation on atoms, either manipulation or uh, measure the spectroscopy. But we have our targets defined before the experiment. During the experiment, we just automated the process of discovery of these targets. The second thing that is very important is that our policies, meaning the way that we run the experiment, were also set in advance. We uh, basically, I mean, obviously we can come up with the fairly complicated uh, decision-making trees, what's not, but uh, our decision-making was defined before the experiment and then the decision-making protocol have not changed during the experiment. And interestingly enough, um, we are kind of going in the area where uh, it, the, the definitions may depend a little bit, but generally when the human operator runs the experiment, you don't learn on the fly. So human learning takes months and years, experiment takes hours and days. So generally when a human runs the operator, you also don't expect the human to uh, learn from the outside sources. So the human of course can react to the change in experimental conditions much faster, but uh, at least in my experience, it is very uncommon to go from uh, running the experiment to reading the textbook and then go back to do the experiment at the same time. So that begs the question of uh, what is next? How are we going to run the experiment with the in automated fashion when we don't know what to discover and what to anticipate? And in order to uh, do that, we need to actually, uh, as I mentioned, workflows are relatively uh, linear. So sometimes you have to go back and explore the things. Uh, turns out that uh, presentations, especially long ones, are also can be nonlinear. So let's make a step back and just look at the uh, concept called the Gaussian process, which is the primary element of the decision-making, the automated learning. So how does it happen? In order to understand that, we need to uh, kind of adopt the worldview of the essentially a statistician. So a physicist sees the world as a connection of data, 
and laws that connect and generalize this data. And based on what you know before, you can make uh, informed guesses on what can be happening into the place of the unknown. From the statistical viewpoint, the physical laws uh, don't exist, at least in the initial setting. What exists is the data generation process, and uh, it basically defines what your data can be. In the most simple scenario, like a primordial chaos from the statistical point of view, uh, if you define a one-dimensional function, scalar function over one-dimensional support, the primordial soup is that uh, any value can be a kind of value of the function can be anything whatsoever. Uh, whatsoever. You don't have any uh, constraints. This, of course, is not very conducive point of view. So the way to introduce some order in your uh, universe is to introduce the correlation from one point to another point. So the Gaussian process is basically the random function, which has only one characteristic that distinguishes this from total chaos. It has a correlation from one point to another. Obviously, uh, you need to define the correlation somehow. So it is done using the concept called kernel, which is essentially a parameterized, uh, parameterized correlation function. So uh, how the kernel look like and how it affects your function is very straightforward. So you can see that this is uh, one kernel length. This is what happens if we increase the kernel length, this becomes smoother. So our correlations are stronger. Uh, this is even la larger kernel length. So again, the function can be anything, uh, but we know how fast it can change. How does it help, help us to do things? Well, if you have a Gaussian process, uh, you can take several measurements. And by virtue of taking the measurements, you actually fix the value of your function at several locations. Uh, but again, it can be a random function, which means that you fix the mean value, but uh, it allows you to reconstruct the value of the function in another location. But you also have the uncertainty. And in fact, that you, in the tutorial, we are going to go through this process in some detail. And I will illustrate how the choices of priors uh, on kernel or on noise actually affect your reconstruction. What matters for the present discussion is that uh, Gaussian processing is a magic tool that allows you to take data measured at some locations and reconstruct the function and its uncertainty make on this measurement. So just focus on this part of the Gaussian process. So somehow we reconstruct the function and we reconstruct the uncertainty. How does it help us to run the automated experiment? Very simple. Imagine that our task is to maximize the value of the function. If we take the measurement and the black locations, and if our reconstruction is the red line, then uh, we can explore the regions where our expected value is high. So this is an interesting region. Or we should to explore the regions where our uncertainty is high, meaning that we don't know the true value of the function, but uh, our uh, but we know that uncertainty is so high that the potentially useful values can be there. So this is called the balance of exploration and exploitation. And uh, how exactly it is done is uh, through the, I mean, there is a whole variety of the ways to uh, summarize our prediction of the function, it's inserted into what is called the acquisition function. So I'm not going to go into the details because first of all, it takes quite a while. And secondly, if you work with the Bayesian optimization, you already know it. And uh, if not, then I'm not a good enough lecturer to be able to explain it in 10 minutes. But basically, let's go to the point that you can summarize your knowledge of the function and its uncertainty in such a way as to explore the uh, parameter space in an optimal way. And uh, with this in hand, the typical active learning experiment works like this. So you do measurements at two locations, you reconstruct the function in its uncertainty based on your policy, how you want to balance exploration and exploitation, you calculate the acquisition function. So the purpose of acquisition function is that you choose its maximum to select the new, new measurement point. And uh, then you repeat the process interactively. You perform the measurement in new point, you recalculate the function, you recalculate the prediction, you recalculate the acquisition function, you do the next measurement. So that's, that's all there is to it. Uh, 
So uh, we started to work on the Bayesian optimization about uh, four years ago. And uh, uh, of course, there was initial learning and uh, writing the support function to actually be able to do that. And of course, our aspiration at that time was to apply it for autonomous experimentation. And we all know what happened in uh, the beginning of the 2020. So all of us were stuck in the, our houses for quite a while. And uh, we made a foray in the exploration of the theoretical models like Ising model using this uh, Bayesian optimization methods. So imagine that this is your phase diagram of the uh, next nearest neighbor Ising model. So this is the line of the phase transitions. Mm -hmm. And uh, what you see is the maximum of the heat, uh, heat capacity for the full grid simulation. So let's explore this space using the Gaussian uh, processing. So in this case, we choose a very greedy approach, which basically means that we sample few locations uh, more or less randomly. Then we encounter the line of this phase transition and then our exploration basically kind of follows this line of the phase transitions. And we thought, hey, it works remarkably well for uh, theory. How about we try to run the same thing for the experiment? So the first, uh, uh, first summer of the COVID, I spent uh, most of my time building the uh, autonomous experiment workflows on the dummy data set. The original concept was we take our data, we define a descriptor, we run the Gaussian processing on this descriptor, and then we would be able to run the automated experiment. And uh, of course, once you start to do something, you have all kind of wild anticipation that this is going to be great, it is going to work instantly, we are going to learn something new, and turns out that none of that works. So uh, a year later, when the COVID restriction got relaxed and we uh, realized the self-driving microscope for the first time, so we de uh, deployed the relatively simple Bayesian optimization on the DJX box. Rama connected it to the, uh, to the microscope to run the experiment. We, uh, obviously, as you can imagine, it was not a day or two to make things work together, but then things started to work. And what you see here is the first experiment of the uh, Bayesian optimization of the hysteresis loop area. So this is the measured area. This is the Bayesian uh, process uh, prediction. This is uncertainty. And uh, you can see that we're actually taking a lot of points, but our predictions are not looking uh, good at all. So after a while, the Bayesian optimization start to converge to something possible. But even if we continue experiment for quite a while, we discovered that the end result is absolutely not good. So this is the ground truth prediction. This is our Gaussian processing discovery. It really doesn't work well at all. So it turns out that if we use the Gaussian processing to make an automated microscopy, we can kind of get away under, after some extensive hyperparameter tuning, we can get away with something like 30 or 40% of measurement points. It looks like a win, but it is not a very big win because we get this uh, improvement by a factor of three at most at the price of much more complex scanning trajectory, much more contribution from drift. So in other words, it's just not worth it. Question is why? And the answer is that if you look at the real image, you can see that it has the structures and the spatial features on all length scales. And uh, the simple Bayesian optimization simply doesn't take into account uh, this type of complex structures because we try to represent all the correlations through the kernel and uh, uh, through correlation function. And, uh, you know, we don't know what is the correlation like here. Is it this or is it this? Of course, there are ways around it. So kernel engineering is very well uh, developed us. But first of all, if we try to engineer the kernel, our computational complexity grows by a big factor. And secondly, then choice of kernel becomes a very strong bias. So depending on what kernel we choose, uh, our experiment will behave differently. And then we told ourselves, look, we really need to go back and we need to admit that simple Bayesian optimization is absolutely not enough for automated experiment. And the second thing that we kind of realized is that when we run the automated experiment, as I sort of illustrated in the very beginning and as I defined as I mentioned with the workflow, uh, 
we almost never have the task of exploring the black box function. So as an example, when we run the automated synthesis on the previously unexplored phase diagram, this is almost a black box function. We don't know what happens inside. When we run the characterization experiments, we don't start from the black box. We start from the overview scan that gives us structural data. And then what we want to do is we want to learn the structure property relationship, meaning we want to do the spectroscopic measurements in the specific locations, which means that we need something more complicated than Bayesian optimization. We need Bayesian optimization informed by the prior knowledge. And uh, it turns out that if you want to do it, we need to combine the two elements that I mentioned before, the uh, deep convolutional networks and Bayesian optimization and the single framework. So this is what is called uh, uh, deep kernel learning. So it was uh, discovered or proposed by Andrew Gordon Wilson in 2016, so not that long ago. So basically what you do here is you take your structural data set and uh, you create image patches. So you have access to all structural data. You take measurements of the spectrum in one or two locations. So this is what we call seed points. And then we train the network using all structural data, but only one or two spectrum. So it's effectively a few short, a few short learning. If you do that, uh, for example, let's say you train the network for all structure, but only one spectrum. Then, of course, your prediction would be the same spectrum. But the interesting part would be that if your initial patch uh, looks exactly the same as your patch for which the, you know the ground truth, the prediction will have very little uncertainty. And if your patch looks very different, then the uncertainty would be large, which basically means that knowing the uncertainty allows you to select the next region for the studies. So if you put it all together, you essentially start with the uh, following Bayesian uh, workflow when you acquire the structural data, measure spectrum, train the model, decide the next position based either on uncertainty or on prediction, and then you uh, complete this loop. So uh, interestingly enough, uh, we uh, were able to implement this first on the electron microscope. So electron microscopes are obviously much more expensive and uh, the price of the error is much higher than scanning probe. However, uh, the electron microscope came with the fully functional Python API, which basically means that uh, we could just deploy the code on the microscope. So this is the example of how it sort of works in real time. And uh, this is the example of the automated experiment. So we took a quote unquote new material manganese phosphate, so this is just a flake. Uh, we take the yield spectrum, so this is the uh, zero loss peak, main electron energy. Then you have two peaks. Uh, this is a bulk plasmon, and this is the surface plasmon. And then we tell our machine learning algorithm, can you please run the active experiment in such a way that you try to maximize the ratio of peak one to peak two? So this is the example of the automated experiment running on the microscope. And you can see that the red points tend to concentrate on one of the edges of the flake. So this is where the ratio of peak one to peak two is maximal. So if we run this experiment for several flakes several times, you can see that um, this behavior generally is upheld. So for this flake, our interesting points are here. For this flake, they are here. Here, the microscope is not sure. It kind of says, meh, maybe this is interesting, but I'm not sure what part is good. Uh, here, it tries to concentrate here. So clearly, our criteria was fairly, uh, fairly rough. So we really uh, did not make it very precise. But none, so there is still some additional factors of variability that differentiate this edge from this edge. But generally, the automated experiment works. And of course, just to illustrate that this is not an edge filter, imagine that I change my uh, acquisition function to just try to maximize the intensity of the bulk peak. So in this case, uh, my automated experiment will actually explore uh, the internal part of the flake as uh, I would expect. So uh, interestingly enough, the topic that uh, is not a part of this presentation, but something that we work on now is what we call the forensics 
meaning how do you make explainable automated experiment and uh, how do you tune the automated experiment during the process. It turns out that the number of ways you can do it through the spatial trajectory or versus through the uh, change in the acquisition function or through the change of scalarizer function is rather significant and uh, kind of making sure that the human operator have access to these control knobs and actually know what they mean is is a very interesting exercise so maybe a, in a half a year or so i will be able to show how it how it operates so the good thing is that if it works for eels it can work for uh, more complex measurements like for distem so i'm not going to go into the detail but uh, just mm -hmm. illustrate that uh, this is the kind of experimental examples of how we run the automated experiment using the 4D stem as our guide. And you can see that uh, this is the example why we actually do need the forensics. In this case, we set, we define the search criteria that discover this cluster, but somehow here, our search criteria was uh, such that we discovered these points. We somehow discovered the center of the hole, and we also discovered some weird behavior in the edge of the scan. So is it a crosstalk? Is it uh, something else? We don't know, but that's exactly the reason why forensic and the tuning of the algorithm in real time are important. Of course, uh, we can run it also for AFMs. So just an example, this is how the AFM uh, connected to the deep kernel learning works. So in this case, we try to uh, explore the areas of the microstructure, which have a maximum history as a loop opening and uh, this is the result. So notice here that here we actually have done something really interesting because we told our microscope to find the regions on the sample surface which maximize the hysteresis loop area. These points, uh, the color of the points correspond to the experimental step. So in the beginning, our microscope was sampling the uh, random regions. And then it discovered that the interesting behaviors are concentrated on the ferroelectric domain. Uh, this is, it makes sense. Uh, as the domain experts, we know that this is uh, where the um, hysteresis loop opening should be maximized. But in case of the human operator, we know that based on the knowledge of physics of ferroelectrics. For the case of the machine learning algorithm, this is a discovery. So a ML algorithm doesn't know uh, where the hysteresis loop should be maximized. It discovers it. So this is great. However, this being said, the deep kernel learning uh, is already surpassing the classical Bayesian optimization. So it uses the prior information about the system to guide the exploration but it doesn't have any physical knowledge. So physics is not a part of the process. Or to be more precise, uh, the physical criteria are encoded in our scalarizer function. So it's, uh, we choose one based on our prior knowledge of the physics of the system and based on our interest as to what we want to discover. But uh, there are no physical laws in the deep kernel learning. So we asked ourselves a question, can we actually combine the Bayesian processes and uh, knowledge of the physics. So we know that classical BIO works in low dimensional spaces. Correlations are defined by the kernel function and uh, uh, we don't use any knowledge of physics. Can we do that? And here the life becomes very interesting because there are multiple amazing books about the Bayesian optimization that basically provide the detailed history of the field that provide the mathematical formulation and then present beautiful examples of how you can apply Bayesian optimization, engineer kernel function and so on and so forth. However, uh, when you take the basic definition of the Bayesian process, of the, sorry, Gaussian process, uh, as any random function, it has the mean and kernel. And the vast majority of the uh, classical statistical texts focus on the kernel function and either ignore the mean function, they just say it's zero, or say that the choice of the mean function is the domain specific. And that's absolutely true. So the mean function reflects our prior knowledge about the physics of the system. And, and for 
uh, Bayesian community, it is a domain specific area. Physics is different. Uh, the algorithms are supposed to be universal. So the interesting thing is that uh, how do we take the Bayesian optimization and actually augment it by some specific mean function which has its own priors. So this is the work done by uh, Maxim Ziadinov who went all the way from deriving the corresponding, um, uh, corresponding or adapting the corresponding mathematical framework and implementing it in the form of code. But uh, this is the end result. So if we have the classical Gaussian process our prior function is essentially just this uh, correlated uh, sausage diagrams. If we introduce the structural Gaussian process, then our prior function becomes a probabilistic model. So probabilistic model means that we have the uh, function, sort of physical equation, and we also have the priors on the possible parameters. So for example, I can define my probabilistic model as all functions who, which have uh, two peaks and only two peaks. And uh, for this function, I also have the priors of what can be the centers of the peak, so they can be anywhere here. Uh, what can be the width of the peak, so I'm a little bit more reserved here. What can be the magnitude, amplitudes? So this is the way how we can incorporate the prior knowledge of physics in our structural, in the structural Gaussian processes. And uh, notice that we do it twice, one time through the choice of the model, and the second time we do it through the choice of the model parameters, so our Bayesian priors. If we know the physics of our system very well, our distributions would be narrow. If we don't know what the physics of the system is, our distributions would be uh, wide. So how does it work? Let me show you an example of the a uh, simple Gaussian process when we try to, uh, to measure the function that goes like this. So this, the black function is the ground truth. Uh, this is how the system really behaves and this is what we want to discover. Uh, the uh, dots that appear is our experimental measurements and the red function is our Gaussian process reconstruction. So you can see that no matter how long we run an experiment, we really cannot reproduce this jump very well. And there is a very fundamental reason for that, that uh, here the correlation is very weak. So the correlation lengths have to be very short. So uh, the only way, but we also assume that the correlation length is the uh, uh, same everywhere across this uh, phase space, which basically means that for us to localize this uh, jump down to some width delta, the algorithm will try to probe the rest of the parameter space at the same resolution. So we need a lot of measurement points. And this is the reason why our Bayesian optimization on the mm -hmm. automated experiment failed in the first place. We couldn't find sharp features. What about the structural Gaussian process? So now let's say that our, we know based on the physics of this system that our prior function have one jump, but then there is some possible ways we can have the uh, behavior to the left and to the right of the jump. In this case, the Gaussian process finds the jump very quickly, so it localizes in the first experimental steps, and then it spends the remainder of the time exploring the behavior of the tails. And uh, during the tutorial, I will show you the example of a little bit more details how that works. So this, of course, can work for more complex cases like a two-dimensional case. So what you see here as the background is the ground truth. This is a magnetization and ising model. So this is what happens if we try to uh, discover this using the simple Gaussian process. So compare the prediction, very diffuse, with the ground truth, very sharp. You can see all the phase regions. And uh, this is what happens if we try to do the same type of prediction using the structural Gaussian model, where we introduce the probabilistic model that the transition from zero magnetization to non-zero magnetization should be sharp. So notice two things here. One thing is that we spend most of our experimental budget discovering the, uh, discovering the uh, kind of transition region. This is good. The second problem is that we also have this region with the uh, kind of intermediate magnetization, uh, which uh, in case of our Gaussian process is actually not discovered. Why? because this is not a part of our prior model. So once we introduce physical model, 
uh, we make the discovery of what we know easier, but at the same time, the model will be tempted to ignore the things that are not a part of the model. So there is always a balance between the two. And then you can ask an interesting question. So uh, very often we don't have a single physical model. Very often when we deal with a known system, we have possible hypotheses, more than one. It turns out that the Bayesian uh, learning or structural uh, Gaussian processes can be expanded to this case. And this is what we call the hypothesis learning. So imagine that you have your experimental system, which can be synthesis, film growth, uh, measurement by scanning probe microscopy or measurement using the device structure. Uh, the only thing that matters is that we have some parameter space uh, in which we operate and we perform measurement one by one in this parameter space. The results of the measurements are passed to the structural Gaussian process, which is also informed by the collection of hypotheses. So these are models with their own probabilities. And of course, each model also has its own, uh, uh, its own priors. Then we do two things. Given the hypothesis and given the physical measurement, our algorithm does two things. One, it updates the probability and parameters of the model. So it sort of learns to select the right hypothesis. And secondly, it suggests the new measurement point that allows us to minimize the uncertainty in the most efficient manner. So in other words, we are pursuing several possible ways towards the discovery of what really happens in the system. And our algorithm tries to choose the way that allows us to learn fastest. The assumption that we make that if your model is correct, then you can learn fastest. If your hypothesis is incorrect, you can try over and over again. And simple illustration of why it is the case is look at the uh, Newton laws. So when people try to understand the astronomy and motion of the solar system or general celestial motion through the correlative models like epicycles, whatever, the models were very complex. So each time you want to introduce the new object, you have to make a much more complicated model. So it means that uh, learning is slow. Once the Newtonian laws were introduced, uh, the whole uh, astronomy was reduced basically to the equations of motion. So the right model is simple. So effectively, we use the same approach here. Uh, just the illustration, this is how it works in real life. So if we introduce three models and we introduce some, uh, in this case, epsilon greedy policy to choose the right one. So we start with the incorrect model one, we sample model two, that's not a good model, we go back to model one. We sample model two just to make sure we kind of uh, balance exploration and exploitation properly. We keep sampling model one, then we try model three. Hey, model three gave much better behavior. So we do a little bit of absolute greedy exploration, but ultimately we discovered that the model three is the right one. And uh, one of the tutorials I will share actually shows how it works in the real world. Now, can we apply it for real world system? The answer is yes. So this is the example of exactly the same uh, combinatorial phase library that I've shown in the beginning. So in this case, uh, we can measure the history of the loops. So which tell us about how ferroelectric it is. We can create our uh, hypothesis. So in this case, the hypothesis is either second order phase transition or first order phase transition. And after running the experiment a while, we kind of come to conclusion that we uh, cannot really distinguish them very well. And actually it makes sense because neither first order nor second order phase transition predict the kind of increase of the behavior. So in this case, it didn't work very well. So we tried to do another experiment. So in which case we use the uh, scanning probe microscopy tip in order to switch the polarization inside the material. So this is something that uh, my group have been working on for uh, almost 25 years by now. So the idea of the experiment is very simple. We take the tip, apply it to ferroelectric. It uh, switches the polarization below the tip and uh, we can uh, quantify the possible mechanism. So uh, which control the domain size versus the parameters of the bias pulse. So it can be thermodynamically limited. So in this case, the size of the domain is determined by voltage, but does not depend on time. It can be controlled by the pinning. So if we apply bias, domain will start to move, but it is pinned by the defects inside the material. 
or it, interestingly, it can be limited by the screening. So we need to inject the surface charges in order to screen the polarization. So as I said, it sounds simple, but uh, ultimately making the exhaustive lists of models actually takes a lot of time and effort. That's kind of where the domain expertise come into play, but they provide the set of possible hypotheses. And uh, then we realize it as the automated experiment on the SPM. So in this case, you have the uh, one computer that runs the hypothesis learning, which communicates to the AFM through the kind of cobbled together version of the hyper language. And you can see how the whole thing uh, operates. So this is our ferroelectric domain. This is the position of the tip. So we apply the bias to the probe. Uh, then we switch the probe into the scanning regime. So we scan our region. And uh, then we use a simple uh, computer vision in order to visualize the ferroelectric domain and uh, measure the domain size. Uh, the size of the domain is communicated back to the, uh, to the uh, hypothesis learning. And based on the history of the experiment, we choose our next parameter. So we choose our next voltage pulse and the next voltage, uh, uh, next uh, voltage magnitude. And then the process is repeated iteratively. So you see the video of how it works. And uh, oops, sorry, this is how the results look like. So this is our parameter space, magnitude, and the length of the pulse. This is how the data that come from the microscope look like. So this is the size of the domain. Uh, this is kind of the algorithm that determines the domain size. And this is how the model is being trained. So in the beginning, uh, we, have, uh, we have several possible ways how the algorithm, how the ferroelectric can switch. So after some number of the initial pulses, uh, you can see that our uh, automated experiment have settled on the model number three uh, that illustrate uh, model number three that actually describe the polarization switching in this case. So why is it interesting? It's interesting because in some sense in this uh, experiment, we realized the fully autonomous discovery of physics by the scanning probe microscope. So we had four competing hypotheses, much like human will have explicitly or implicitly before the experiment. In this particular case, we know that this hypothesis, the full spectrum of experimental eventualities and then the microscope chooses parameters in such way to find out which of the hypotheses is correct in the kind of most expedient manner. And uh, it's interesting because the same approach can be implemented in many other automated experiments. Now, a very interesting question that comes into play is, uh, is it going to be the case that uh, a microscope that automated agent can substitute human. And actually, the more I work on the automated experiments, the more I come to conclusion that absolutely not. So the reason for that is threefold. So the first is that when we start the automated experiment, we typically plan our experimental strategies, use the prior knowledge, which can be very deep and very domain specific. Secondly, even before we start the experiment, we define the reward. So why are we running the experiment? What is our logic there? And uh, the reward is absolutely not defined in the context of the machine learning. It's defined by the uh, human operator, by the funding source, by the funding agencies, by the societal need. So uh, this is, again, uh, this is external parameter to machine learning. And third argument is that during the experiment, uh, I expect that the way the field is going to develop that the low level decisions and fast decisions would be made by the AI and uh, the high level decisions and sort of tuning the experiment would be done by the human. So it turns out that uh, figuring out what are the knobs that you can um, tune during the automated experiment is actually fairly complicated. But as I said, now we have a framework that at least allows to systematize it. There are some interesting things going forward. So one very important thing is uh, making hypotheses. So notice that if we already have the uh, hypothesis and the theory and uh, uh, in the form of the prior, then the purpose of the experiment is twofold. One is to compress the prior to posterior, so to improve our knowledge. 
and the second is to discover new things. However, when we run the experiment, we cannot explore all the possible eventualities. So we cannot go in all directions at the same time. We need to somehow determine the directions in which the experiment can be most promising. So this is a, a problem for which humans are actually good at and machine learning at least for the time being is remarkably bad. So extrapolation and formation of hypotheses is not something that machine learning can reliably do at this mo moment. And uh, uh, for me, it kind of goes very close to the boundary of what is AGI and all the other futuristic concepts. However, once we have the hypothesis, then automated experiment is very well defined in terms of the probabilistic programming. How we formulate the hypothesis I mentioned is an open issue. Maybe you can do it by kind of generating all possible hypothesis uh, compatible physics. Maybe there are other ways. That's an interesting area of research. Another thing that I want to mention is that uh, if you're interested in running these experiments by yourself, so you're welcome to the, uh, to the Atom AI and uh, microscopy repositories, and I will illustrate this in the tutorial. And uh, let me briefly, maybe in five minutes, uh, illustrate uh, how the introduction of the workflow approaches, kind of going certain back to the opening of my presentation, how can the introduction of automated experiments and automated workflow change the science for all of us? So this is the picture which I made about uh, five years ago is the sort of motivation for running automated experiment. And that was the limitation of the classical paradigm of the characterization studies. So typically uh, we have some ideas about hypothesis and what we want to study. We choose the material, we make sample, we characterize it. And very often what we get out of it is the qualitative image or paper on the microscopy technique development or at best theory experiment comparison based on the simple matching. So very often we run the theory until we get something that agrees with the experiment. And then we think, hey, uh, we accomplished something. This is the time to publish things and move on to the next problem. So this of course is uh, not really a physical discovery because uh, more often than not hypothesis driven science appears only when the results are used as a part of larger physics. So the hope is that once we add the automated experiment and learning from the data, uh, learning physics can be much more systematic in this approach. So the second uh, aspect is that uh, classically when we talk about the microscopy and characterization, uh, the process goes like this. So we have a human operator that works with the instrumental control, the controller kind of communicates much faster with the microscope. Uh, the researcher or a small group generates the data, thinks about what it means and communicates this data to the scientific community through social networking, publication, archive, and so on. There are several problems in this. So first of all, typically we analyze only a small fraction of the data that we get. Secondly, our analysis is often very often very biased. So we find generally what we know what to look for. And the latency of interaction between the individual and the scientific community is usually very low. So that's uh, notice that machine learning as a field developed exponentially for the last 10 years. Imagine that the only way the new machine learning algorithms are communicated were through the classical publication. So it probably would take three times longer. So the hope becomes that once we transition to the automated experiments and uh, associated data structure and data infrastructure, we can transition to the imaging in the cloud when essentially all microscopes are connected of the same type are connected to the ecosystem of the data storage repositories, codes that allows us to analyze it. So just having your data on the cloud is useless unless you can analyze it. And the, hopefully we can get the feedback from the cloud to the microscope operation in real time. So what form it is going to take, either the decision-making or pre-trained networks or discovery of something unusual that somebody has predicted, uh, that remains to be seen. And of course, uh, this decision-making can also be incorporated close to the level of the single microscope. And uh, 
again, this is the slide that I made about seven years ago about adding the expert system at the edge of the instrument. Uh, yesterday, I have seen a posting from Tonio Bonasisi, who already made a chat GPT a part of his uh, archer fish modeling. So that's actually now doable. And interestingly, the technical activation barrier to get to run the uh, non-optimized expert system on the individual tool now is actually fairly low. That being said, these were technical parts, which are solved by engineering and by the fact that this tool becomes available. There is a scientific part. We still don't know how to uh, engineer and design the workflows. So if I want to understand the behavior of the material in the statistical sense, I can find out how to formulate the exploration strategy from mesoscale to nanoscale to atomic scale, if I only want to do the discovery. But I, the problem is that most of the time, I'm not interested in just microstructure. I'm interested in the microstructure that is responsible for some specific aspects of the physics of the material, which means that I need to rely on prior knowledge of what is interesting. Uh, I have to take into account my own biases and I need to be able to ascribe a value for this measurement. So how do I decide? Should I make more measurements on the mesoscale, which are relatively cheap? Should I take more measurements on the nanometer scale? Or in which cases should I take the atomically resolved measurements? So for the time being, we do it with very little consideration of how to do it properly. Obviously, we need infrastructure. But as I mentioned, uh, that's already being done. So infrastructure and the ecosystem. And uh, the interesting point is uh, what may the labs of the future look like? So in this case, uh, the clear example is the cloud labs, like the Emerald Cloud. So interestingly, uh, the labs of the future, at least the real labs of the future, are not run by the robots. They actually are run by humans, because uh, humans, in some sense, are cheaper and can perform much larger variety of operation. But they are, uh, they are orchestrated by a robot. So in some sense, it works like a fulfillment center. And then if you ask a question, what would it take to enable the transition to the automated labs across the field? Uh, the answer is that, well, there are several steps that we can identify. One is uh, we need to define our crosses in terms of the workflow and uh, the, we need to have a hyper language that can be executed to a hyper language in which this workflow are written. Notice that it doesn't have to be robotic labs. It doesn't have to be, uh, it can be purely human lab, uh, operated lab. We still need the hyper language. We need reward functions. So unless we understand why we are running the experiment, we cannot optimize it and we cannot define the workflow. And the workflows for the human-based uh, activities are always hierarchical. So we need to define how does a better knowledge of microstructure allows us to learn the physics of material. Or if, uh, why would the specific DFT calculation help us understand what happens during the experiment? And the final thing that I pose we need is that we need to learn how to create experimentally falsifiable hypothesis. This is simply the reflection of the fact that on the one hand, we cannot explore everything. And at the same time, we limited to make uh, best guesses based on what we already know. So this is uh, hypothesis generation is probably going to be the most interesting aspect of the domain-specific machine learning. So just to finish my presentation, let me say that uh, directions in science are launched by new tools much more often than by new concepts. So this is uh, mentioned by Freeman Dyson. Uh, I think that it applies not only science, but technology as well. So if you consider transition from scientific R&D uh, TRL1 to the manufacturing TRL7. And uh, uh, Machine learning, cloud connection, data infrastructure is necessary, but not enough. So the question becomes, can we as the domain uh, community start to think in terms of the workflows, the design, optimization, and forensic exploration? So uh, thank you. And uh, I would be happy to take questions or we can discuss things during the tutorial part. And uh, for those of you that uh, decide not to stay for tutorial, Let's keep in touch and it turns out that uh, Twitter is probably the best way of doing that.